This is on the house church movement. Now, I want you guys to know that I did not know a lot of information before preparing for this talk, but this is something that a lot of people have asked me about, and it's something that I know has been popular in our community here, our small community up here in Leadville. So I wanted to do a discussion on the house church movement, and in order to prep for this discussion, I read two books. So I want to show you guys those books. I don't think that these are the definitive guides on the topic, but I think they are relevant, okay? So this is the first book I read on the topic, Pagan Christianity by Frank Viola and George Barna, Exploring the Roots of Our Church Practices. That's the first book I read. And then after I read that, they said, this is part one. Here's where we tear down everything we know about church as is. You got to get part two if you want us to teach you how to build up a new church. So part two was Reimagining Church by Frank Viola. And I'm going to be honest, both the books were really, really similar, but they said you got to read both. So I also got Reimagining Church by Frank Viola. Okay. So these are the two books I, I read on the subject. I'm not saying they're the definitive guides. I'm not saying that these guys answer all of the questions. There are other books out there on the home church movement, but these are the two books I referred to. And so that's what I'm going to be discussing from tonight. These books were very, very interesting because I hadn't heard these topics or these arguments really before. I know that people had moved to the home church or house church movement, but I kind of didn't know the background of why, um, what the purpose was or anything like that. And so that was interesting for me to interact with these works. Okay. Now these guys don't explicitly say, if I go here to my notes, these guys kind of give two applications. They don't explicitly say they're for the house church, but they have a lot of materials that are being used by house church advocates. Okay. So I just want to talk about that briefly in reimagining church. Frank Viola at the end says this, he has two points and this is what kind of starts him on the journey of being open to the house church or home church movement. It's this one, the institutional church as we know it today, and he means Roman Catholic, he means Baptist, he means non-denominational, he means Lutheran, he means Methodist, etc. The institutional church as we know it today does not reflect the church that God originally intended. So this is a radical rewriting of church as we know it. And the institutional church, what you're used to experiencing when you go to church is according to Frank Viola, not the church that God originally intended. That's point number one. Point number two, the church that scripture envisions is organic. This is going to be a key word when it comes to the house church movement, guys, organic. The church that scripture envisions is organic in its nature and expression, and the Lord desires to recover it today. So this is the perspective. We've lost the organic church that God intended, and we've, we're stuck now in the institutional church that God did not intend. So we need to jettison or chuck out the institutional church, and we instead need to in recover the organic church. This is Frank Viola's thesis. Now, what is it? If I could describe what this organic church is, how would I summarize it? Frank Viola in the first chapter, first and second chapters really of reimagining church uses the Trinity as his framework for establishing what church should look like. And what he essentially appeals to is this mutual submission within the Trinity. He essentially says that within the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, father, son, and Holy spirit all mutually submit to one another. If you know the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, it says that within the one being that is God, there exists three co-equal and co-eternal persons. It's that co-equal phrase, three co-equal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that Viola really wants to lean into. He says the church should match that, okay? So if the Trinity is our example and they're co-equal, then in church, we need to have a co-equal setup where all members are on the same playing field on the same level. He gets this idea from phrases like the priesthood of all believers talked about by Peter and also concepts like the fact that 
we submit to one another out of love, etc. Viola essentially uses this mutual submission platform, and he says this, Hierarchical structures within church are not biblical. That's his contention. Therefore, we should get rid of them. There should not be pastors that are in charge of other people, dictating to them or telling them how they should live their faith or how they should walk in the Christian life. He does say elders are appropriate, but the way he arrives at elders is the fact of their age and experience, and they don't rule over people. Instead, they are just recognized as experienced people within the community. Okay, and so that's what he wants to get rid of. He goes to this doctrine of mutual submission. This is what's the case in the Trinity. It should also be the case in the church. So he wants to get rid of pastors. He wants to get rid of hierarchical structures. He wants to get rid of what he calls clergy. He says all of that is unbiblical. All of it isn't actually what God intends. Instead, God wants us to just be mutually submissive to one another. Nobody is greater than anyone else. No one is above anyone else. We all need to be on the same playing field. And that is essentially the framework from which he builds out his doctrine of how church should go. Here is his definition of an organic church. Now, I do want you guys to know this at the outset. They do not say organic church equals house church. In fact, I have a quote from them on this subject right here. George and I do not argue for house church as the correct model for church. We instead point to the organic expression of the church or organic church for short, something different from a house church. So not every house church, according to Frank and George, meet the criteria of an organic church. They criticize some house churches in the books, okay? But most house churches are seeking to implement some ideas from their works, okay? So I just want you to know they're not completely coterminous with each other. Let's jump into Frank Viola's definition of an organic church. An organic church is one that is naturally produced when a group of people have encountered Jesus Christ in reality, external ecclesiastical props being unnecessary, and the DNA of the church is free to work without hindrance. So notice the phrases, naturally produced, encounter Jesus in reality, DNA of the church is free to work, okay? To put it in a sentence, organic church life is not a theater with a script. They say that's what we essentially do when we go to church. It's a gathered community that lives by divine life. By contrast, the modern institutional church operates on the same organizational principles that run corporate America. And of course, their contention is you don't want your church to be modeled after corporate America. You want it to be modeled after God's organic building within people's lives. That's their idea. What does this look like today from Viola? So I want to describe to you what Frank Viola sees as a good house church. So for this, I'm going to go to reimagining church. He has a section on what does this look like today? So I just want to read that example to you because this is this is what he thinks right here what does it look like today this is what he thinks a house church and again not for him house church but an organic church this is what it looks like so i gave you his definitions i want you to get the feel for what he thinks church should be done like so here's his example about a decade ago a church made up of about 25 christians gathered together in a home one evening I had just spent a year and a half ministering Jesus Christ to this group in bi-weekly apostolic meetings. What he means by this is he was teaching them how to run a house church, essentially. The goal of that ministry was to equip this new church where it could function on its own without any human headship. The day arrived. The church was going to have its first meeting. I wasn't to be present. I snuck in the room without anyone noticing and hid behind a couch. I felt that if I were visible, it would have affected the way they functioned. This is usually the case when a person who plants the church is present during its gatherings. The believers gathered together. So here's to, here's to him what an organic church looks like, okay? The believers gathered together and began the meeting with singing. The singing was a cappella, no instruments, guys. A Christian sister began the meeting by starting a song, and everyone sang with her. Then prayers were offered spontaneously, one by one. Kind of a popcorn prayer type of idea. Then a brother in Christ started another song. By this time, everyone was standing together. More prayers were offered. More songs were sung. During the singing, different ones would share short exhortations based upon the lyrics of the songs. The word moving 
doesn't quite say it. So it was a moving, you know, event for him. There was no song leader present. All were participating in offering praises to God freely and spontaneously. Okay. After they sang for a time, everyone sat down and immediately a sister stood up and began sharing. She spoke about how she had found Christ as her living water during that week. She read a few verses out of John 4. As she began to share from the text, two other sisters interrupted her and shared insights out of their own experience from the same passage and the same theme. Yet, what they shared of Christ was different. When the first sister was finished, a brother stood up and began to speak. He also talked about the Lord as living water, but he spoke from a passage in Revelation 22. He spoke for several minutes, and then a sister stood up and began adding to what he had shared. This went on for over an hour. One by one, without pauses, brothers and sisters in Christ stood up and shared out of their spiritual experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. They all revealed him as living water. Some shared poems, others shared songs, others shared stories, others shared from scripture, others offered prayers. As I heard all of this from behind the couch, I couldn't resist the tears. I was so touched, I began to weep. That meeting was electric. It was as if a flowing river had poured into that room and it couldn't be stopped. I could sense the Lord's presence and grace. The sharing was rich, full, living, and vibrant. I wished I had a pen and pad to write down the glorious things that were being said. Many of them bristled with seminal insight. But I just listened in amazement. The incredible thing was that no one was leading this gathering. No one was facilitating either. No human being, that is. And it was incredibly Christ-centered. The meeting finally wound down and someone stood up and began a song. The rest of the church stood up and joined in. As they sang, I slipped out of the room. Only a few people noticed me. Okay, there you go. There is an example from Frank Viola of what an organic church meeting and gathering looks like. Notice there's nobody in charge. There's nobody running it. Instruments aren't used. There isn't a team of worship people. They sing a cappella and everybody prays spontaneously and freely and everyone speaks spontaneously and freely as they discuss with one another. Okay, so that is for Frank Viola what church ought to look like. This is an organic gathering with that everybody participation. This is going to be a big theme to him, guys. In an organic church, according to Frank Viola, everyone participates. One of his big hangups with institutional church is that 90% of the Christians are passive recipients of the sermon, of the worship, of the, you know, elements of the bread and the, and the wine, etc. And he says this is wrong and he wants us to run church that everybody participates in. That's his idea. So now that I've given you a feel for it, let's walk through some of the differences in doctrine. On the left over here, guys, we have the institutional church paradigm. And on the right, we have the organic church paradigm. Okay. And I'm going to read each and give brief explanations. He's got a lot of notes here. I'm just going to read each and give brief explanations. If you want more details, you need to read pagan Christianity and or reimagining church. So the institutional church, bad church, spends most of its resources on building expenditures and pastor staff salaries. He constantly criticizes that we spend so much of our financial resources in church on buildings. They don't like the idea of church buildings, okay, and on clergy salaries. That includes the pastor, but is not limited to the pastor. By contrast, an organic church spends most of its resources on the poor among you and traveling workers who preach the gospel and plant new churches. So the focus is not so much on a church building where we all go. The focus is instead on the poor and supporting others in our community. The second difference, the institutional church operates on the basis that the pastor priest is the functional head while Christ is the nominal head. Okay, what they mean is the pastor priest does most of the church stuff. The pastor priest does most of the ministry. Okay. Whereas in the organic church, this operates on the basis that Christ is the functional head through the invisible guidance of the Holy Spirit through the believing community. So practically speaking, because we've eliminated the hierarchy with among us, now Christ is truly the functional head. Okay. And only the Holy Spirit guides us. All right. We don't have a pastor telling us what to do. Instead, the Holy Spirit tells us what to do. 
Next, a institutional church extols and protects the clergy-dominated, program-centered system that serves as the driving machine of the organized church. Okay? It's all about the clergy. It's all about programs. Instead, the organic church rejects the clergy system because it quenches the sovereign exercise of the Holy Spirit, yet lovingly embraces every Christian within that system. Every member functioning. Very important to them. Okay? Every member functioning. No passive observers in an organic church. Everybody participates. Next one. An institutional church recognizes and affirms hierarchical leadership. Remember I said hierarchy bad? Instead, an organic church rejects hierarchical leadership, recognizes and affirms the organic leadership of the whole body, all working together. Next one. A hierarchical or institutional church builds programs to fuel the church and treats people as cogs in the machine, whereas an organic church builds people, people over process, guys, in Christ to provide the momentum for the church. So it's not about programs. It's not about process. It's about building up people. Next one. An institutional church encourages believers to participate institutionally and hierarchically. We've built systems that you can plug into. We've got ministries that you can volunteer for. Instead, in their organic church structure, it invites believers to participate relationally and spiritually. You're not a cog in a machine. You don't have to get involved in institutions and hierarchies. You relate to others and you get involved spiritually. Another one here separates church ecclesiology from personal salvation, soteriology. This is a big one for him. He goes back to the early church and says, look, whenever you got saved in the early church, you were baptized into the congregation. He says, now we have this idea about a sinner's prayer where you get saved and then baptism is almost like an afterthought to people. He says, no, that's not what it should be. We should not separate ecclesiology, getting involved in the church from soteriology, getting saved. And he says ecclesiology is a mere appendage for soteriology. In an organic church, by contrast, forges no link between personal salvation and the church, sees the two as inextricably intertwined, okay? Scripture has it that when people were saved, they simultaneously became part of the church and immediately met together. You're one into a community of people. Okay, I'm going to go through these other ones quick because many of these are repeats, okay? Again, institutional church, clergy system, organic church, no clergy. Institutional church seeks to energize the laity. Organic church doesn't even recognize the separation between laity and clergy. Notice that, right? We're all like, laity, get involved, get active. And they're like, there's no difference between laity and clergy, so we're just doing our thing. Next one. Institutional church limits many functions to the ordained. The ordained pastor has to do this thing. Whereas in the organic church, all members function as priests. Okay, leaning into Peter at that point. Institutional church renders the bulk of its congregants passive in their pews. They show up and they observe. Organic allows and encourages all Christians to engage in whatever ministry God has called them to. Institutional associates church with a building, a denomination, or a religious service. Organic affirms that people do not go to church. It instead affirms that they are the church together at church. Institutional rooted in unifying those who share a special set of of customs or doctrines, okay? They really try to minimize doctrinal differences and they really try to promote unity. Unity, unity, unity. So they think denominations and individual churches promote division due to doctrines or customs and contrast that with organic church rooted in unreserved fellowship with all Christians based upon Christ alone. That Christ alone aspect is going to be important. We'll come to that. Institutional church thrusts ordinary Christians out of the Holy of Holies and chains them to the pews. Organic Church liberates all believers to serve as ministers in the context of a non-clerical, decentralized form of church leadership. Finally, Institutional Church places its priority on programs and rituals that keep its congregates at arm's length, insulating them from one another. Organic Church places its priority on face-to-face -face shared life relationships, mutual submission. L again, look at the language that's used. Mutual submission, openness, freedom, mutual service, spiritual reality. The very elements that were built into the fabric of the New Testament church. Okay, so those are some examples of your differences. I read you an example of what a service might look like. I read you an example of the differences. You should be getting a good feel at this point for what they think real church ought to look like. 
organic church ought to look like, and let's get rid of the institutional church according to them, okay? Again, I want you to know, I did not go through all of the Bible verse. I, I can't review the entirety of the book, right? If you are interested, are there any biblical support to what they're saying? Get the book. Pagan Christianity talks about it, and he talks about it in Reimagining Church. I don't think you need both. After I read both, I thought there was a lot of overlap between the two. But one of them is going to help you. Probably Pagan Christianity is where they try to jettison as much of this. It, the two books work together kind of like this. Pagan Christianity seeks to tear down this entire paradigm. Reimagining Church seeks to build up this entire paradigm. Okay? So if you're more interested in the, an argument that says what we're doing right now is unbiblical, look at pagan Christianity. If you're more interested in an argument that says we can do something better, look at reimagining church. So those are some of the aspects and the background that you're going to get from it. Now, again, I realize I'm just caricaturizing it, but I'm trying to be as fair minded and even handed with my explanation as I can while I go through it. Next, I want to go on to my problems. These are some of the big things that jumped out at me. These are the big themes that I think are kind of problems with the model and the book that they're putting forth. Later, I'm going to go through the things that I think are strengths. Okay, so don't get too angry about my identifying problems, but I didn't accept both books completely wholesale and just think that they're amazing. Okay, I do have some problems. I want to discuss them here. So first, let's go into my problems. Okay, and these are just general broad themes. I am not trying to cherry pick here, guys. I could easily go through chapter after chapter and attack individual statements they make. I have no interest in doing that. Instead, I want to take the broad picture of their argument and deal with it on a real level and Throw out there what some of my misgivings are. Now, I do want you to know there's a quote in one of the books. And it says this. It's really hard to get a man to see the truth when his salary depends on him believing a lie. So, I want you to know, Frank and George would both say that I am biased. Okay? My salary as a pastor depends on me rejecting their approach. Because if I was to take their approach, we would jettison my role and my salary along with it. And so they say it's very difficult to get a man to believe the truth when his salary depends upon him believing a lie. I want you to know I'm trying my best to be objective in this situation, not to hold anything back because I, I desperately want to keep my salary or anything like that. I'm trying to give you guys my best, most objective approach. But I want you to know they would probably criticize me as not being objective enough. Now, I have five general critiques, okay? These are broad-themed critiques. And again, this is over the course of two books. First, there's a strong sense of criticism leveled at traditional and liturgical denominations. I'm a little more open to all of their arguments because I'm a Baptist, because I've been in a lot of non-denominational and Calvary Chapel-type churches, because we don't have a strong liturgical tradition, because our church government is congregational and independent. Their arguments are likely to hit a lot more home with me because what they're getting rid of is a lot of traditional and liturgical denominations. I imagine that a Roman Catholic, a Lutheran, Somebody that comes from an Episcopal or Anglican tradition would really bristle at a lot of their arguments. It's just, they, they like, they seem to hate Roman Catholicism, for example. They level so many of their arguments in pagan, pagan Christianity at Roman Catholicism. The only reason we do this is because of Roman Catholicism. The only reason we do that is because of Roman Catholicism. We've adopted this from Rome. Rome made this, you know, and... I, I just don't, it's so funny because they say accept all Christians from all traditions in reimagining church, but they so often attack these traditional and liturgical denominations that I fail to see how many of them would find it interesting or open. The second criticism I have ties into this first one. They are strongly dismissive of the early church fathers. This was especially the case in pagan Christianity. They say things all the time like the early church never practiced dot 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 or it wasn't until the second century that dot 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 it wasn't until constantine that dot 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 they're super dismissive of the early church fathers and it made me ask this question while i was reading it is this a little bit sola scriptura gone awry like they completely divorce christianity from the second century and beyond 
If it isn't said in the New Testament, if it can't be demonstrated from the Bible, they're not interested in it. And I can't help but think that Irenaeus might have a few good things to say about a, f a couple of these topics. I can't help but think that Justin Martyr might have a little bit of insight when it comes to how church was practiced. But they just throw it all out the door. All of it. How you read your Bible in your own context, right? And they say they try to read it in the historical context. But they constantly pit even the second century against the first century. It's kind of crazy to me. They're just so dismissive of the early church that I kind of wonder if they're not taking Sola Scriptura a little too far at this point. And again, I'm Reformed Baptist. I love the Protestant Reformation. I love the five solas. This just felt like they were trying to wrench it out of its historical context a little too much to me. Point number three, they make an implicit argument. Because X is the case in the New Testament, X ought to be the case now. I think this is most egregious when it comes to church buildings. Their hugest argument for, well, actually against church buildings is the early church always met in houses. The early church repeatedly met in homes. And then they kind of take that idea and say, see, we shouldn't have church buildings today. They do address tangentially somebody saying, well, just because they didn't have church buildings back then doesn't mean we can't have them now. You know, our situation has changed. But it's at that point, then they level arguments like, but look at how much money, look at all of the upkeep, look at, you know, blah, 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 blah. Again, there's an implicit argument that kind of runs throughout both books that because X was the case in the New Testament, X ought to be the case now in church today. And I just think that's a bit of a strained argument. I think the church adjusts, evolves, molds, etc. with culture. Now, they have a quote on this, but it was in the author's notes at the beginning of Pagan Christianity, which was written many years, not many, but several years after the book had been in circulation. So they were kind of recognizing, like people have criticized them on this before. And here's their quote in Pagan Christianity. They say this, We do not believe that just because a practice has pagan roots, it is wrong. We instead argue that those practices that contradict the teachings of Jesus and the apostles should be discarded in favor of what they taught. Again, this is in 2011, the author's note in pagan Christianity. And it's almost like they tacked this paragraph on in the author's note because they had been getting so much criticism. Guys, I couldn't help but think that a lot of the argumentation was essentially this. This is the way it was in the New Testament. Therefore, this is the way it should be now. They just don't give a lot of room for how church might, huh, dare I say, organically evolve over time. My fourth problem or objection. I think they have an unworkable double standard for doctrinal disputes. This comes up in Reimagining Church. He has an entire chapter devoted to to doctrinal disputes. Check this out. The trouble today is that scores of Christians have not made God's acceptance the basis of their fellowship. They have either added or removed something from this basic standard. And he says it's it's doctrine, okay? If a group of Christians demands anything beyond a person's acceptance of Christ before admitting that person into fellowship, then that group isn't a church in the biblical sense of the word. It's a sect. Do you see that? Boom. He wants to boil down unity within the church to just acceptance of Christ. If you've accepted Christ, you're in, according to them. You guys know I have done, I don't know how many videos on church unity. I've done like two, three, maybe four videos on church unity. And I try to make the circle as big as possible without compromising the cores of the faith. What do I say? You got to get God right. You got to get the gospel right. I don't say you got to get baptism right. I don't say you got to get eschatology right. I don't say you got to get any of those things right. What do I say? You got to get God right and you got to get the gospel right. He draws the circle even wider than I do, guys. He says the only thing is acceptance of Christ. Mormons accept Christ. Are they in? Islam. Muslims accept Christ. Maybe not his sacrifice, but they thought he was a prophet. I think they're drawing the circle too wide on this one, guys. And the irony of this approach, stop using doctrine and theology to divide, 
is that they spend the entirety of the book, Pagan Christianity, attacking doctrinal and theological positions of current denominations. They assume that baptism is a Credo Baptist position. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a Credo Baptist. But what do you do when you get people who believe in infant baptism come into your church community? Are you going to baptize their infants or not? After all, you can't separate them out based upon anything other than their acceptance of Christ. Okay? What are you going to do at that point? They establish this system that I think it's a double standard that doesn't work for doctrinal disputes. They say we're all under Christ. Unity is paramount. Stop fighting about doctrine. And yet they spend two books arguing theology and historical doctrinal issues. I just think it doesn't work, guys. Don't get me wrong. I try to draw the circle very wide, but I think they draw it too wide and in a way that is unworkable because so much of the two books rely upon their interpretation of doctrine and theology. Number five, my fifth problem is what I'll call expressive individualism. If you want to know more about the topic of expressive individualism, you need to read Truman. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism, and the Road to Sexual Revolution. Great book from Carl Truman. Here's the deal, guys. Expressive individualism says that you need to be your authentic self out there in the world and institutions and corporations, etc. stop you from being your authentic self. I am sorry, but these guys implicitly lean into the spirit of the age. The, the irony is they're saying like, hey, we're returning to the heart of the original church. We're returning to the New Testament church. When in reality, they are so strongly leaning into expressive individualism. They constantly attack the institutional church as being rigid, structured, hierarchical, etc. And they constantly approve of their model as being organic, real, authentic. Guys, this is expressive individualism at its core. And it's a very recent development. It's a very recent phenomenon. Now, don't get me wrong. They often say things like, you're not an individual so much as you are part of a community. They say things like that, but even look at the church meetings that they structure. What do they do? Everybody participates. Share what's on your heart. Offer up a prayer. Offer up a song. Offer some words. They're leaning so hard into modern expressive individualism without even knowing it, right? They attack rugged individualism, and yet they support this community, mutual submission, but there is a real exaltation of expressive individualism in their movement. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that organic church is bad because it's expressive individualism. But what I want to say is they are, in my opinion, a little bit blind to the fact that for all of their statements about this is what a New Testament church looks like, they are so strongly influenced by the spirit of the age and the modern mindset of expressive individualism, okay? And they seem they seem almost blind to that difference. Again, look at how their church meetings function. Every member participates. Express yourself. <laughs> you know, it's expressive individualism at its core. Read some Truman. Read some Charles Taylor if you want a little more insight on expressive individualism. Now, let me answer the expressive individualism part. Now, if you guys want to read more on this, well, you know what? Let me turn to let me turn to what Truman says. Nor does this allow for any kind of Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox triumphalism, whereby the history, historical continuity and unity of the institutions, blah, 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 blah. But that does not really address the matter of lived experience. Every faithful cradle Catholic has still made a decision to live his or her Christian life as a Catholic amid a world of other possible options, from atheism to Islam to Bible churches and Pentecostalism. When it comes to how we think of ourselves, we are all expressive individualists now. It's just endemic to how we think, guys. Like, if I say the word, I just want to be authentic. How many of you guys took that negatively? None of you. None of you authenticity is the order of the day okay and even me deep within my heart i've expressed to you guys that i just want to be authentic out here that is language of expressive individualism par excellence we're all expressive individualists now we can't pretend that we are not participants in this cultural mindset at this point 
So, all we need to figure out is, as expressive individualists, how do we live out in the real world? Why am I bringing all this up? I've got a few points that I liked from their book. And one of the points I liked, I know I just brought it up as a critique because they seem to be blind to it. One of the points I like is they lean into expressive individualism. Expressive individualism is the air our culture breathes. If we can implement expressively individualistic practices in our communities, that is going to be a strong evangelistic and spiritual outreach to unbelievers. People are naturally expressive individuals now. So if our churches look more like expressive individual societies and groups, that might win them over. So I actually like this about the book. Here is a model of at least a few ideas we can implement to be more appealing to our current culture and society without compromising biblical truth. That is a win. Now, you, we have to remember what you win them with is what you win them to. So we need to recognize that if we're going to win them with authenticity and expressive individualistic language, they're going to expect that in our communities. But that might not be all bad. It's just something we need to think about. Another thing that I like about the book, they constantly attack passive Christianity. I love this. Okay. They all, always focus every member participation, etc. It is so difficult in modern churches to get every Christian to participate in the community, to get every Christian to participate and not just be a pur pure consumer. I struggle all the time in our churches with consumer Christians who just show up to get fed something and then leave. I love that they bring this up, guys, because they're getting rid of consumer Christianity and saying, look, we all need to participate. We all need to get active. We all need to get involved. That's a good thing for our churches. By any way of measuring, that's a good thing for our churches. And finally, they promote life on life. The fact that we are not meant to just meet with our congregational members once a week. They, they bring up a point that a lot of people don't feel comfortable sharing intimate details with other members in their congregation. Why? Because they don't know them very well. I think that's a bad thing. We need to know each other better, and they really promote this life-on-life -life Christianity where you're going to get to know the other Christians in your church very well. You're going to be praying with them. You're going to be talking with them, discussing with them, etc. So life-on-life -life is a very good point from this. So it's not all bad, guys. They help us reach our current society and culture in a way that a lot of our older institutional churches don't. They attack consumer Christians and instead get them to be active in their faith, and they promote life on life, where you're actually getting involved and getting some skin in the game. I like all of those aspects about their books. Now here's kind of my final question. I know I've gone a little bit long, guys. I have a final question, and then I have a few ways I want to implement some of the things I learned from these two books, okay? Must we throw out the baby with the bathwater? Is the answer we must throw out institutional church as we know it and rewrite everything the way it was put earlier by Shea. Do we have to tear it all down to the studs? They seem to think so. Let me give you some quotes from Frank Viola. It's my conviction that the attempt to work for a recovery of organic church life where Jesus Christ is head from within an institutional church is a futile exercise. Futile exercise, he says. Such an attempt can be likened to the dismantling of a tower from the ground. If those disassembling the tower come close to compromising the structure, the tower will fall down on them. The only way to dismantle a tower is to proceed from top down. Next one. Seeking to repair a house that has cracks in its foundation will never produce, prove productive. I believe it's time we honestly examine the structural integrity of the modern church system. I strongly believe the clergy system, which includes the modern pastoral office, is what needs to be abandoned. It's the system that's one of the main culprits, not the people, the motives or the intentions. Experience has taught me that an institutional church will never fully embody the dream of God until it recognizes that the framework within which it operates is inadequate and self-defeating. Despite the good intentions of the persons who, persons who populate it, the interior design of the organized church sets us up for defeat. True renewal, then, must be radical. One more quote. 
Let me be clear, the call of God to recover the primitive simplicity of organic church life requires that we begin on entirely new ground. A ground different from the religious systems and traditions that we fallen mortals have constructed, that ground is the Lord Jesus Christ." End quote. I'm sorry, I don't agree that we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't agree that we need to tear down the entire edifice and rebuild from the ground up. I don't agree that it's all over. And again, I said it earlier, I'm a pastor, so therefore I'm biased, perhaps. But I think we can take a lot of what they level their charge against. I think we can take a lot of what they attack and we can implement it in our current church structures. And so these are four action items I want to proceed with. This is not exhaustive, but it's meant to be representative. Okay. These are four things I want to implement in my church to help shore up many of the weaknesses that they identify. This is what I want to do. First, we, I think, need to recognize that Sunday services alone are woefully inadequate to equip our people. I am sorry, but showing up to church, participating in the Lord's table, and sitting through a sermon that's 45 minutes to an hour at most is not sufficient to equip our people for the work of ministry. It's not sufficient. We need to treat Sunday service as the beginning of our ministry of equipping the members of the church for the work of ministry. We need to treat it as the starting point. We need to treat it as the entryway. But once people have come through, then we need to implement regular meeting on a weekly basis to encourage and help and serve and disciple our people. Okay. I don't think throwing the Sunday service out and replacing it with their vision of what a Sunday service should be is the answer to the conundrum they point out. I instead think we can continue to work with the Sunday service the way we have it, but also implement midweek meetings that look similar to what they're talking about. Prayer meetings, worship meetings. We can sing a cappella if they like. We need to set up meetings where individual members of our church are able to lean into their giftings. If somebody has some sort of preaching or teaching skill, but they're not on the pastoral team or whatever, fine. Ask them to speak up on the Wednesday meeting, the Thursday meeting. Ask them to, to bring a 10 minute word to encourage the hearts of the other believers. Now they're getting active. Now they're getting involved and we didn't have to throw the entire Sunday service out the window in order to do it. So that's the first application I want to make of their work. Second one, we need to create more opportunities for life on life. It's increasingly evident to me that if you see people once a week, even, even twice or three times a week, but you're always doing church things together, you don't engender that true relational community that you need in order to be real with people. We need more life on life. You need to spend some time with the other members of your congregation out to coffee, out to lunch, out throwing, you know, disc golf together, out playing regular golf together, out, you know, on, on a hike together, etc. More life on life with the individual members of our church body. They're dead on about this, okay? Throughout the week, we need to be actively meeting with other church members so we can learn and grow and develop, pray with them, etc. You need to be close to them. We are far too individualistic in American evangelicalism. We are far too consumeristic. I go to church to get what I need out of it. I don't got any skin in this game, and then I go home. No more, guys. We need to have life-on-life -life opportunities with one another throughout the week, and we need to give back to our other church members to help them and support them. Number three, we need to challenge our people to participate and exercise their giftings, okay? We have to push back against passive church consumers. Like I said, that was one of the things I liked about the book. They get everybody active involved. And I think this is primarily on the shoulder of our leadership teams. Get active in your members' lives. Figure out what they're gifted in and figure out how to leverage those gifts. Create ministries and opportunities. Don't just plug them into, hey, we need somebody in nursery. Why don't you go serve? No. What are they good at? What are they gifted in? What are they skilled at? What do they need to work on? How can they improve? 
figure all that stuff out about each of your members and then create ministries around the people that you have. Help them to implement their giftings so that they will continue to grow and improve and learn. And again, we don't have to tear down the entirety of the church edifice in order to do it. Finally, we need to challenge our budgeting. I think they bring up a good point. We just went through our budget rewrite for 2021. And what was the budget rewrite? A lot of money ded dedicated to clergy, building up keep, etc. We are trying to get our missions budget up to 10% of the total budget. 10%, guys. And we're actually going to advocate for that this year, 2021. 10% of our budget is going to be dedicated to missions at First Baptist Church of Leadville. When you think about it, that even is a bit lame, 10%. And don't get me wrong, I'd love to push beyond that at some point, but it has taken this church years and years and years to get to the 10% mark. I think we need to kind of re-envision and reimagine how we budget in the church and what we're spending our money on. Pastor Shea sh said this earlier, maybe you can support clergy and buildings, but dedicate the majority of your finances to serving. I think we can radically flip our budgets. I remember a story of JC Penny. He used to tithe 90% and keep 10 for himself. That's incredible. That's incredible. We might need to flip our budgets and stop dedicating 90% to buildings and administration and instead throw a lot more at missions and helping the poor, etc. Okay? These are four applications I have. I liked a lot about the book. They it was challenging. Challenging books, pointing out major flaws in our current church structures. I do not agree with their assessments that every single one of these things that we've adopted as the church are pagan practices that need to be jettisoned. I don't agree with their fundamental assumption, even though they deny this assumption. I don't agree with their fundamental assumption that just because something was implemented after New Testament times or has pagan roots, that it shouldn't be practiced. I disagree with that. I think that we can do church with much of what we currently do or implement, but heavily modify it to shore up a lot of the weaknesses that we currently have. I liked the books. I thought they were challenging. I'm not coming away from this saying we need to throw it all out and become house church. I have a lot of respect for people who are interested in joining a house church or being a part of a house church community. I have a lot of respect for them. I see some problems in implementation, especially when it comes around the um, areas of theology and doctrine. And don't get me wrong, guys. I draw the circle very wide. I am not a theological purist by any stretch of the imagination. That's where I get most of my criticism, in fact. The fact that I don't draw the circles tight enough around theology and doctrine. Okay? So, I think there's implementation problems when it comes to that. I do agree with Stead when it comes to accountability, when it comes to authority in the church. I think there are some implementation problems there. I think it's not so self-evident how you build a church in this way. But I do think our churches ought to adopt many of these ideas that they're promoting, especially when it comes to life on life, all of the members functioning, people not being consumer Christians, not just relying on the Sunday service to equip the people. So lots of good stuff from these books. These are my thoughts on the house church movement as a whole. I hope that's helpful to you guys. Okay. I respect people who are in this movement. I do see a few problems in, in implementation. I don't think they're insurmountable, but I also don't think we have to tear down all of our current church structures. However, our current church structures do need to see where they're inadequate and figure out how to shore up their weaknesses. Hey guys, Pastor Tanner here. I hope you liked that video. And if you did, would you please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons? It helps us very much. In addition, we've got two links down in our description below to both our Twitch and our Discord. If you're interested in getting more involved in our community, we'd love to see you there. Take care. God bless. Bye now.